I think I speak for everyone when I say that we are very excited for this new series by, by Rabbi Dweck uh, on the principles from the different writings of Rambam. Just a couple of uh, announcements. Uh, the new journal comes out next week or so, and this edition includes some magnificent essays on a variety from a variety of Rabbanim, Dayanim, other guest contributors, uh, as well as a few of our Talmidim. Uh, we're soon to be launching the website as well. Um, on the journal will be details and like everything, we'll be adding features and a content to it slowly and developing it bit by bit, but it's important we have that website up and running. Last point, if any of you do have a uh, spare time, you know, feel free to, to volunteer. You can message Sina or myself. There's always little things and, and tasks that, um, to do. So today's Chabura is Leilu Nishmat Michael Chaim Bar Mazal. It's Ohad and Asaf uh, Fedida's uncle, um, who is Haskaraz today. Uh, anyway, that's it from me, Rabbi. Thank you, Avi. Where is Asaf Fedida? If he didn't attend Shiur tonight. I think he's looking for the password, so he's, well, gonna, he, he's trying to get in. I need to talk to him about the song that he played for the introduction for the 10 minutes <laughs> thing before we start. It's a very important piece of music. Where is he? All right. Anyway, we'll tell him that I wanted to talk to him about the music. Um, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be begin a series that um, should be many, many uh, parts, but we only have three. And so it's extremely difficult to choose which principles to um, give in three parts that we have. And I chose tonight because I, I heard from Sina that, and I, I sent a voice note in response to it, that there was a discussion in the, in the Chabura group about um, korbanot and the meaning of korbanot and whether there'll be korbanot when the Mashiach comes and all of that business. I'm not going to talk about that tonight directly, but what I want to address is this concept of meaning uh, applying to mitzvot that do not necessarily have inherent, explicit, sensible meaning to them, what we would call in our religious I shouldn't say religious, but in our halachic vernacular, hukim. How does Harambam deal with these things? How does Harambam understand these things? And what does he tell us about these things? And ultimately, what is it that we, we can learn? What principles can we learn from these things? So that, that's the principle we're going to address tonight. And, um, and I hope, you know, I'm been, we've been, Sina and I have been working on the curriculum for the coming year for the Chabura. And we have some really, I have to say, I mean, I'm extremely excited about it. We have some really amazing shiurim set up, lined up. We have amazing teachers lined up. And I'm very, very proud and happy to say that this is what we're going to be putting forward. So I'm going to be teaching some things, but this I, be, I hope to have as a recurring uh, insert into the curriculum because these these principles and the way that Hanabam teaches them are essential. And the truth of the matter is that uh, on Sunday night, for example, I gave a class to this group uh, in Herzliya who likes to have Thursday night lectures, and they invited me to give this lecture. And the lecture that I gave to them on Thursday night was the absence was looking at the absence of secular studies in um, Orthodox yeshibot. And I presented to them some ideas about how it is that we look at the world and why, you know, what place secular studies have and differences between Sephardim and Ashkenazim in terms of approaching these things. Um, and one of the things that I said was that we we study the Torah as a as as a framework and lens with, with which to see our world. And somebody wrote me back and said, "How do we study Torah that way?" And uh, and that's why these. Shurim on the on the principles and 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 uh, you know uh, the ideas that essentially shape our thinking around Torah and the world are absolutely essential because it teaches us how to frame our thought. Um, and Harambam writes this. I don't have on the on the source sheets, but you can look at this. You can look at this because it'll be translated different ways based on the version of the. 
edition that you have because Harambam originally wrote it in Arabic, but he writes at the end of Masichet Berachot in his Pirusha Mishnah that Yakar Be'inai, he says, it is more precious in my eyes, Lamed Yesod Me'ikare Hadat, to teach a principle from the framework of our dat, right, of what it is that we do in terms of our keeping of the Torah, mikol davar asher anamed, from anything else that I can teach or that I will teach. And that's how Rambam talking, right? Rambam taught everything. And what he's saying to you is that of anything that I teach, the most important thing that I could teach, and therefore he says, and I will pause then when I have the opportunities to teach you a principle. Because the principles help us think. They give us the manner in which we think. They don't just give us data. And once we have the principles, we can, we can appropriate the data. So that's what this, this series is meant to be. And, and um, we're going to be looking at various places in Harambam throughout. But tonight, we're going to look specifically at how Harambam deals with Hukim and what we learn with, what we learn about the way that he deals with the Hukim. So um, I'm going to put up the source sheet for you. Give me a moment. Um, you'll, you will have either received the link to it uh, before on the, on the chat. And, um, and I think that we put it up in, in the chat over here, but I'll open it up so that I can share it with you. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna look at is Gemara which is the Gemara upon which Harambam bases his treatment of the idea. This is a Mishnah and Yoma. And the Hachamim here say, Tanur Banan, Hachamim uh, taught the following, it mishpatai ta'asu, uh, when it says mishpatai ta'asu, that you should do my mishpatim, what are mishpatim? What are these judgments, right? These rules that the Hachamim gave. They are devarim, they are things that if look, if the Torah had not written them as role, as rules or laws, it would it would make sense, it would be it would be right and and just to establish them as laws because we would we would sense the need for these laws. And these are them. And when they say these are them, they're not saying these are the only ones, these are examples of them. Avodazara, you know, you shouldn't worship things that are not God. Giloy arayot, you should be careful about promiscuity. Shechut amim, don't murder people. Gezel, don't steal things. Berkat Hashem, don't blaspheme God. Those are all things that are reasonable. You could say that to a person and say, look, this is something we shouldn't do. People say, yeah, it makes sense. We shouldn't do those things. But then it says, what is the hukim? What are the hukim that, they, that the Torah tells us to keep? That the hachamim say, devarim shea satan meshiv alehim. Achamim says those are things that the prosecutor uses. And what does that mean the prosecutor uses? So later the Achamim say that this has to do with, with the, the elements that people find in our Torah that make us vulnerable. And those are these, these, these laws. What are these laws? Achilat hazir, eating pig for one, for one instance, I know, why wouldn't we do that? I mean, it's not something that you give somebody, look, let me give you some, you know, some moral space, right? Sit there with your, with, with your thoughts and tell me, tell me what laws make sense in terms of our dietary uh, engagement. Look, people eat bacon every single day and, you know, it doesn't make a massive difference in terms of how is living lives. Chad Chad Niz shouldn't wear wool and linen, not something that we would necessarily come to because of our own sense Halitzat Yebama, that when a person's brother dies without kids and uh, his wife is, is left living, that I, she becomes my wife. And if I don't want to, her to be my wife, I have to do this special thing called Halitzat. It's a unique relationship and situation. It's not something that I've never necessarily come to on my own. Taharat Mitzora, the whole process for purifying a person has Sarat. Not, definitely not something that I would come to on my own. Sa'ira Mishteleach, this this goat that needs to be thrown off a cliff for Kippur in order to be able to atone for our sins, that and all the other korbanot for that matter, as we'll see. These are things that are hukim. Shemet omar tohu him. I mean, it's very possible that a person could say, look, these things, 
are meaningless. They don't have any order. Right? That's the idea of tohu. They're, they're chaotic in the sense it doesn't seem that they fall in any appropriate order or place for law. Talmud Lomar, rather what it is that we think of these things, Ani Adonai, right? Because it says, Mishpatai ta'asu, hukotai tishmeru, Ani Adonai. Do my mishpatim, keep my hukim, I am God, Ani Adonai. What does that mean? Hakaktiv ve'en lecha reshut le'arher bahem. I am God. Don't forget that I'm God speaking to you. I have, I have carved these things out in law and you have no permission. Leherher bahen. Leherher bahen doesn't mean to think about them. Leherher bahen means to doubt them and to start questioning and criticizing them based on your sensibilities as to what these things mean. So that's the Gemara. The Gemara is saying, look, Mishpatim, if the Torah didn't write them, we'd write them. We'd figure out that these are appropriate things to do. Hokim, even the Torah does write them. We still don't get them. I mean, they don't necessarily make sense to us. Okay, now I'm using that term very um, specifically when I say these things don't make sense to us because it's important for us to examine what it is that that word means. Why do we... Why do, when we talk about things that we recognize as being rational, as being reasonable, do we talk about these things as making sense? Because when we talk about sense, we think about intellect, but the reality is our senses have nothing really to do with our thinking. When we talk about the five senses, we're talking about things that we sense, touch, taste, sound, yeah, smell. These are things that we just get from having some interaction with them in our world. We don't have to really think them through tremendously. So when we say that something makes sense, it's very interesting that we use that word and it's not just an English anomaly. There is something about sensing things as being real, as being meaningful, without having to think about them too much. It's something that we just recognize as part of the nature of reality and it fits. And what it's saying is that the hukim do not make sense. We don't sense them. The mishpatim, we sense. We recognize these things as being part of the reality of our world and that we can recognize that doing them has problems in terms of reality. But the hukim, not so much. So that's the basis. Those are the definitions that the Gemara gives about mishpatim and hukim. Sensible mitzvot and mitzvot that are not sensible. Right? In the literal sense. So what does Harambam say? Oh, Harambam writes the following in Hilchot Teruma, excuse me, Temura. Right? What is Temura? Temura, there's a halacha, that if a person is makdish, a an animal, for example, or an other item for that matter. But we're talking about animals. For Korban. It says this animal is for Korban. And what he wants to do after sanctifying, being makdish, that animal for Korban, he says, you know something? I'd rather exchange that animal. Timurat otodavar, right? I want to give an animal in place of the animal that I already was makdish. Not allowed to do that. Not allowed to do that. Not allowed to do that. Once you've given it, it's given. It's not yours anymore. And if you try to do that, there's a penalty. Not only is the thing that you gave Kodesh already, but what you want to replace it with is also Kodesh. And that's what the laws of Tumura are. How, how do all the dinim around that mitzvah run? Now, interestingly, in this halakha, Harambam, he does what he does in many halachot. And this is something that I encourage you to pay attention to because we're talking about a class of Harambam's principles. So this is something that I encourage you to pay attention to. Harambam often in the Mishneh Torah will close sets of dinim with principles and thoughts that are in line with the nature of the law that he's teaching. And this is an example. He's talking about Tumura. He's talking about, look, if you give an animal and you're Makadish, that animal, and you want to replace that animal, then that's a penalty. There's a penalty that the animal that you want to replace it with, even if it's more expensive, by the way, even if the animal is a better animal than the one that you gave, you cannot replace it. Why? It's not yours. That's why. You cannot give strings attached to God. 
shouldn't give strings out to anybody, but certainly not a string attached to God. And so Arambam starts to talk about the meaning behind that in this law, but he decides that here is the place that, that he wants to talk about these things. So take a look what he says. He says, look, Af al pi shekol gezerot him. Listen very carefully. He says, even though, Af al pi literally means nose on mouth, right? Which we're not going to talk about now. Why is that a why is that a phrase? But he says, Af al pi shekol gezerot him. Even though all the hukim of the Torah are gezerot, they are decrees from God. Right? Ani Adonai, like the Gemara says, right? That's the end of the Gemara. Ani Adonai hakakti ve'en lecha reshut le'arher ba'en. I set them as law. You have no, no permission to think about them and question their value or meaning and base your adherence to them on that. So even though all the hukim of Torah gezerot him, kemo she'be'arnu besof me'ilah, and we will look at the end of me'ilah in a moment. I'm looking at it in a different order. He says the following. He says, nonetheless, which is different than right? Like I said, it's, it's fitting to contemplate them. And in your contemplations of these things, as much as you can, kolma. Anything that you can give time to it, right? Now, what does it mean give time to it? It doesn't say anything that you can discover. It's time, right? It doesn't say kol davar shata megale tamo or motse botam. Notice, Haramban is very careful with his words. He doesn't say any reasons that you discover in it, any things that you find in it. He doesn't say that. He says you contemplate them. Anything, any reason that you can assign to it do so. Now, what does he use? He uses the word tam, which literally means what, gen gentlemen and ladies? Taste, which of course is one of our senses. And what he's talking about here are mitzvot that do not make sense. That's by definition what the hukim are. We do not have tam for them. We don't know a tam for them. And that means that we do not sense them as being meaningful or real. So he says, look, you should think about them carefully. It's fitting, as a matter of fact, to think about them, and you should assign taste to it. Because for all intents and purposes, hukim don't taste. You can't taste them. There's nothing there. There's no, there's no an element of interaction that I have with them that allows me to sense them and taste them. I can't. It's not like murder that I can taste. I taste that right away. I mean, obviously, you know, we allow murder and people be dropping dead in the streets right and left. Nobody's safe. It's not, it's not like theft that I can taste. Of course, I recognize that easily, sense it immediately. These don't taste. I don't sense them. So what Harambam says is, if you can assign taste to these mitzvot that are tasteless, well, by all means, if you can add some salt to it and help it, you know, help you digest it, then do that. I mean, look, the Hachamim Rishonim, the first Hachamim said, the king, King Solomon, he understood very interesting language here. He knew most reasons for all the Hukim. Right? He doesn't say that he knew most of the hukim. He knew all the hukim and had reasons for all of them. Most of them. So then he goes ahead. Why does he do that whole introduction? Because he wants to talk about Timura. And he immediately continues. says, Yira'eli. It seems to me, which also is a very important language over here. Hanan Baba is not saying this is the time. He's saying, it seems to me, and then he continues on. You could read what he the reason he gives later on. That's not for it to know from that. And he proceeds to give a reason. He assigns reason to it. 
Now, he doesn't just say that you should do this haphazardly because remember that he says over here, bonen bahem. think, just think about what place this might have in Torah. Think about how these interconnections work with this mitzvah. What is the place of this mitzvah in the matrix of mitzvot? As it says, as lo evosh bebitil kol mitzvotecha. So, so try to understand. Understand what, what might be the place of this mitzvah in the corpus of mitzvot, in the overall direction of Torah. What, what, what uh, overall tenor can I find in Torah itself in terms of my life? What is Torah telling me to do in general? How does this mitzvah come to serve that? All of that, wonderful, good. So we can talk about this. And Harabam actually talks about that later on in Timurah. He talks about what is the purpose of all the mitzvot of the Torah in general. And he says, and that being the case, well, then this means. Okay. So that's the Hukim. So Harabam says, look, assign reasons to it. Now, the question is, when we say, when Harabam says to assign reasons, is he saying that you should, that means you should discover what the reason actually is? No. Do we know what the reason actually is? We may stumble upon it. Can we know emphatically that that's the reason? No. And what difference does that make? Makes a big difference, as we'll see. Because what we'll see is if the reason that you assign to this thing in some capacity fails, no matter how smart you are, even if you're Shlomo HaMelech, and remember, Shlomo had some real problems with this, didn't he? I mean, Shlomo, like it says, Rov Tamim Shel Kol Torah. He also figured out, you know, why why a king shouldn't marry too many wives. He also figured out why a king shouldn't have too many horses. He also figured out why a king, you know, shouldn't do the things that he did. And then he said, well, since I know why, I'll just do all of them because I realize that I'm not going to have the problem, which didn't go very well for him. Nonetheless, if these reasons that I assign for the hukim somehow break down in particular circumstances, it does not invalidate the power and authority and imperative nature of the hukim. Why? That's why. So the purpose of assigning the reasoning is in order to make these things more sensible to me so that I can taste them, I can sense them, I can incorporate them into my life and make them more engaging with me and my world. That's by all means, Harambam says, Ra'ui, if you can do that, do that. And he continues, right? He, he wrote this earlier, but I want to see this with you as well, right? Because he talks about both Mishpatim and Hukim here. And this is also an important thing to think about. When you read Harambam, and this is specifically to Harambam, not exclusive of other things necessarily, but very important with regards to Harambam, is that Harambam, especially, especially with the Mishneh Torah, was so meticulously careful, went over the Mishneh Torah eight times in his life, that it is one whole work, and that it is important if we want to learn principles from Harambam that we are careful to not simply look at isolated presentations. We need to be able to cross-reference Harambam as well, to be able to know his broad writings in order to be able to genuinely get a sense of his framework and, and teachings and principles. So he addresses this also at the end of Hilchot Ma'ila which is at the end of Sefer Avodah, Hilchot Temurah is the end of Sefer Korbanot. So he talks about this as follows. He says, Torah He says, look, it is important again, like to contemplate the Mishpatim of the Torah. Notice the language. He says, and to understand the, the end of their, the to get to the bottom of it, basically is what Sof Inyanam means. You should try to understand the Mishpatim of the Torah, which are the sensible mitzvot of the Torah, which speak to your sensibilities and get to the bottom of them to the degree that you are capable of doing. 
ודבר שלא ימצא לו טעם, and if you don't find the reason of it as you delve into it, ולא ידע לו עילה, and you don't get it, because your senses are blunt to this particular משפט, אל יקל בעיניו, don't, uh, shouldn't make light of it. לא יארוס לעלות אל אדוני פנפרוץ פה, don't uh, attack God's מצוות, lest he attack you. ולא תהיה מחשבתו בו כמחשבתו בשעה דברי חול. You shouldn't think of these mishpatim, which seem to be common law, civil law, things that have to do with our everyday lives, as other things that have to do with our everyday lives and our mundane experiences, because there is an element of Kodesh tied to them. But notice here, Harambam is not talking about assigning reasoning. Here, Harambam is saying discovering reasoning. What do you find the reason to be? Get to the bottom of the mishpat. בואו ראה כמה החמיר התורה במעילה, yeah, he says about the משפטים, I mean, look how serious Torah was with מעילה. מה עם עצים ואבנים עפר ואפר, כיוון שנקרא שם אדון העולם עליהם בדברים מדבר, now you see why הרמב״ם is talking about this in הלכות מעילה. What is הלכות מעילה? הלכות מעילה is the laws of a person who steals something that's הקדש. If something was given as קודש to the מקדש, and somebody steals that, it's called מעילה. It's a special class of theft that is called מעילה. So Harambam is saying, listen, if there's such a severe prohibition of stealing things that are Kodesh, that are essentially sticks and stones, all the more so, even if you did it by accident, you need Kapara, all the more so, mitzvot, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us these laws. He gave us the laws. We're not giving something as Kodesh. He made this Kodesh. Gave it over to us. person should be very careful about messing around with them. Yeah, don't kick them. Just because you don't get the reason for it. They are unreasonable, sensible to you. Maybe there's something wrong with your senses, but these are sensible things. Yeah, so he brings a pasuk here and he says, Why do the hachamim put their hukim and their shpatim together in the pasuk? Hachamim teach us something else about the Hukim. Amru Hachamim ten shmira ve'asiyah lahukim ka mishpatim. Why? Because the Hachamim wanted the Hukim to be related to by us equally to the mishpatim, even though they aren't sensible to us. Ha'asiyah yedu'ah v'hi she'asiyah hukim. Right? Obviously you do them. Shmira, what is the element of shmira in them? And this is also important. There's so much to learn. I mean, it's so much to learn here. People often think that the word asiyan and shmira are the same in the context of mitzvot. You shall keep them and do them. Two completely different things. Keeping a mitzvah is not the same as doing a mitzvah. One is protecting it and one is executing it. Performing it. Two different things. What is the shmira of a hok? Shmira of a hok is that you better be careful with them. Don't think that they are less than the mishpatim just because the mishpatim makes sense and the hukim don't. Just because you can't taste a hulk doesn't mean you should treat it as valuable. Like the mitzvot you can taste. I mean, look, mishpatim are the mitzvot that have very clear taste. I understand I'm translating literally, but I'm doing it on purpose. The good of doing them is very clear to all of us. Like gezel, right? Like theft and murder and honoring parents. But the hokim are mitzvot that just don't taste. We don't know what they taste like because they don't fit our taste buds. They don't match our senses. We don't have mechanisms with which to pick them up, to process them. Like the Gemara, just straight out of the Gemara that we learned. We, we are almost repelled by them because we think, why do we have to do this? It's so weird. And all the other nations of the world, they, they, they use those to make fun of us. And to ask us what's wrong with us. And he gives the same examples of the Gemara. So, what do we have so far? 
what we recognize is that Haram says, look, the Hukim clearly are mitzvot that are not sensible. And when I say not sensible, I don't mean that I don't mean this sense. I mean this sense, not this sense, this sense, this sense. They're not sensible. And so Harambam says that that makes no difference because in their inherent nature, they are commands of God. They are decrees of God, gizeroten. And that's enough, is the imperative that requires us to do them. But Harambam says, you should have a relationship with Harukim. They should become part of your world. Bring them in to your sensible world. If you can give taste to it, you need some sauce, I don't know, get some ketchup or whatever it is that you need and put that into the mitzvah. Why? So that you can taste it. Why is it important that you should taste it? It's important that you should taste it because then it opens up to you. You become more comfortable with it. And you can start to learn from that mitzvah. You will start to look at that mitzvah with open eyes. You will see it, you will smell it, you will taste it, you will feel it. It will become part of your life. And it will not remain out there as something that has no taste or smell or feel. It doesn't talk to you. Help it talk to you. And if you do that, you will see that you will learn from these mitzvot. So an example that Harambam, so what does Harambam do, right? Harambam does this. I mean, he, he, he's nae doresh v'naeme as we say. He tells us to do this, and he does it himself. So a huge portion of the Mishneh Torah is dedicated to giving tam, to assigning reason to the Hukim. And he does a wonderful job. I mean, a masterful job on Rambam because it's the Rambam. I mean, you know, this is not uh, just some individual throwing reasons at mitzvot. This is Harambam sitting and contemplating it, contemplating the reasons for mitzvot, giving tam to the mitzvot. That's, I mean, Harambam was a really good cook when it came to mitzvot. He served up some amazing dishes. So I want to look at one of the mitzvot with you to help understand this further. What do I want to understand? The following. I recognize that oftentimes, I mean, throughout my rabbinic career, I hear the same thing over and over and over again. And I just heard it, uh, again, relayed to me, because I'm not in there, but uh, relayed to me, that the same thing came up in the Chaburah discussions. And oftentimes it comes up with regards to Korbanot, but I want to steer clear of the Korbanot because it's so classic that everybody gets stuck in it. I want to look at it somewhere on something else so that you see the principle. If I understand that this is what Harambam is telling to me with regards to the sensibility of these mitzvot that are hukim, that do not make sense to me, but nonetheless, I should assign sense to them, right? I should assign taste to them. I understand then that what I am doing is not discovering, first of all, reason for mitzvah. And we'll understand that a little deeper in a moment, but that I am also not discovering emphatic purpose for mitzvah. I may be assigning reason, but I'm not discovering purpose in the sense that, in the, in the approach that, if the reasoning that I assign fails, it does not invalidate the mitzvah or the imperative nature of the mitzvah. Now, the thing is, is that Harambam gave phenomenal reasons to the mitzvot because Harambam was coming from two major places over, overwhelmingly. One was a historical one, almost an anthropological one, right? Recognizing what about, what was going on in humanity that was severely problematic around the time of the giving of the Torah that the Torah spoke to. So what were some human conditions that were there, that the Torah needs to speak to. And the second is the actual reality of the nature of the human condition and nature itself. What is it about human beings that we know that the Torah spoke to to address? What is it about the nature of life and the experience on this planet that the Torah looked to address? So that's where Harabam is coming, which is a very sensible, obviously, place to come from because that's our senses. Our senses evolved from all of this stuff. So if I want to give sense to something, I'm obviously going to look at those things. 
I'm not going to look at some, um, you know, uh, superficial moral ideas. I'm going to look at the roots and the real muddiness of the human condition. Because that's what the mitzvot are speaking to. So one such mitzvah is the mitzvah of Shilu HaKin. Shilu HaKin is this interesting mitzvah that Kadosh Baruch Hu says, look, if you need to take birds from a nest, send the mother bird away first. Don't do it while the mom is there. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say because that's so cruel. It just says, that's what you do. If there happens to be that you find a, a, a nest and you want those eggs, you cannot take the eggs while the mother is there. Send her away. And then you can take the bunny. Okay, good. So that's a mitzvah. It's a chok. There is no apparent reason for this. Yeah. It's a very specific mitzvah too. It's like this particular situation, this is what you do. Okay, fine. So let's see what reason Harambam gives to the Shilu HaKen. So let's take a look at the Morena Bukhi. Harambam says the following. Now, it's important to know because I pulled it out because I don't want to fill it with a ton of text. The mitzvah just before this that Harambam explains is what we call Otoved Beno, that you're not allowed to slaughter a mother cow and her child and it's young on the same day. And the reason why Harambam says not going to do that is because it's terrible, caused terrible tsar bale haim to do that. So then he comes to Shiloh HaKin, tsar bale haim means distress to the animal, right? Suffering. So he says, Vizeu tam gam Shiloh HaKin. He goes, by the way, that's also the tam in Shiloh HaKin. That's the taste for Shiloh HaKin. Why? He says, He says, look, the, the usual case is, is that when a mother bird is sitting on a nest with the eggs, the eggs are not necessarily fit to eat at that, in that situation. He says, when you send her away, Right. If you need for some reason to take the eggs, and we'll see in a minute why Arabam says they're not really fit to eat the eggs that are being sat on by the mom. Yeah. They're premature. So he says, if you send her away, she will not have distress in seeing that her eggs are being taken. And the truth of the matter is, it may be. Because a person has to take the mother bird and send her away, and because the eggs are not really fit to eat, people just not do it. <laughs> so Harambam is looking at this mitzvah as a deterrent, right? Not like how people do it today, where people, oh, there's a nest with a bird, and then, oh, let's send the mother bird away and take the eggs, which is a complete inappropriate thing to do, according to Harambam. Not to mention the fact that even the people who do it, do it wrongly, because they don't even learn the halachot of Shilu HaKed. And there's a lot of halachot of Shilu HaKin that nine times out of ten make it inappropriate to send the mother bird away in the settings that we have it. I'm not going into the details of the law now, but nonetheless, Harabam is saying part of the element of this mitzvah is to keep people from doing it. So it says, Gorem ala rov al-azivatakol. Kevan shenil kah eno ra'u'i la'chila berov mikrim. Right? Because once it's been taken in that situation, it's not usually fit to eat. In most of the cases. So the Torah hopes that people don't do it. And if with these kinds of spiritual, how Ramam calls them spiritual, but you know what we would call psychological, emotional distress, and Yisurin literally means hardships and suffering, the Torah was concerned about with animals all the more so the Torah is concerned about these things with us and that we shouldn't cause these kinds of sufferings to other people. And he goes, no, I know what you're going to tell me. I know what you're going to tell me. There's the halakha, which we're going to look at in a minute. Because there's a halakha that says, that if a person is praying and he says in his prayer that the mercies of God reach the nests of the birds, we tell him to shut up 
and throw him off of the Teba. We get him off, for, we fire him as a Shaliyah Sibur for that day anyway. Well, he says, Kizar had Mishdeh Zibur the Shiriz Karnum. He goes, This is one of two reasons that we mentioned. Kilomana Shkafat Misha Zubir Shen Tam the Mitzvot El Haratzon Mufshat. He says, Because the only thing that we can know in Mitzvot is an abstract reasoning. He goes, And I don't hold that. I don't hold that that mitzvot are only abstract reasoning. Now, it's interesting because what Harambam is saying with that, he's saying, look, I mean, some people think that the mitzvot are only abstract reasons that we don't understand. And when we try to understand them, they're inappropriate, right? It's inappropriate for us. He says, look, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think that this is okay to, to recognize this as a reason for this mitzvah. It teaches us something. That's all he's saying teaches us something. And it is a perfectly acceptable thing for us to, to learn from the mitzvah. Now, Rav Kafir over here, this is important because Rav Kafir points something important out over here. And he says, this is his haga, his footnote. He says, Il male hayiti He goes, look, I mean, I'm not fit to say this, he says, which is very humble of him. Although I would say if I was, <laughs> he goes, if I was, I would say the following. When do we shut the person up? When the person in his prayer uh, uh, um, infers or suggests that it is God's mercies that reach the bird's nest, that's when we quiet them. Why? Because Harambam writes something else, which we'll see in a minute. He says, I mean, look, it's a nice reason, Harambam. It teaches us something. But the truth of the matter is, if that was the emphatic reason, if that was the motivating purpose for Shilu HaKen, we shouldn't have Shehita at all. I mean, cruelty to animals, for goodness sakes, if the Torah was really worried about cruelty to animals, don't slaughter them. Finish. Harambam himself writes this. Why was this given? To instill in us and to, in, in, to fasten into our hearts that we should, how do we look at this? The first thing that we reference when we look at this is cruelty. So then good. I'm not saying that that's the emphatic reason. That's not the purpose for this mitzvah. You don't know the purpose for this mitzvah. But since of this mitzvah, what is the sense of this mitzvah? This is perfectly acceptable, acceptable to look at. And it ex- instills the midav rahamim and, and clemency, hemlav hanina, and pardon in our hearts. Now, why am I showing you this? Because this is an interesting thing. Harambam has to say over here, Al he, he knows that there's something that possibly contradicts this. And he says, look, I get it. I'm just ta- telling you that this is an element of Rahamim and it's okay to look at it that way. But what you should not do, and this is essentially what Rav Kafir is saying over here, what you should not do is read that in the Rambam and then expect that that is the reason for Shiloh HaKen, meaning that is the purpose for Shiloh HaKen. Purpose is not sense and reason. It's a completely different thing. You don't know the purpose. What's the purpose? I said so. That's the purpose. Now, I said so. If you are have an ability to be able to take what I said and incorporate it in a way that is palatable in your life, by all means, absolutely do so. But don't make the mistake of thinking that if it isn't palatable to you, that it isn't because I said so, that you must do it. And so therefore, how do we know that that's the case? Because when a person takes his tastiness of a mitzvah that he attributes to the mitzvah, that he assigns the mitzvah, and puts it into prayer as though it is an emphatic truth, we shut him up and get him off the teba. Don't confuse the two, you idiot. You can say what you like about assigning reason to the mitzvah. All, by all means, that's a wonderful thing to do. Make it palatable. Good. Make it reasonable. Good. Make it sensible. Wonderful. Do not make the mistake of saying that the sense that you gave it is the emphatic purpose of that mitzvah. That is not true.
It is not reliant on your purposes, no matter how brilliant they sound, no matter how wonderful they fit. And if we get somebody that's, that decides to put that into the prayers, because prayers have to be truthful. We do not lie in prayer. You see so, so powerfully that we don't lie in prayer. I didn't put this on the sheets, but I'll tell this to you uh, uh, parenthetically, and you can look this up. There's Gemara. It says that the Hachamim, the Nebi'im, took out the word Gibor in the prayer. So when we say Ha'el, Ha'gadol, Ha'gibor, Ve'hanora, they removed it from the prayers. Removed it from the prayers. Moshe Rabbeinu said that. Ha'el, Ha'gadol, Gibor, Ve'hanora, what does that mean? Well, they removed it from the prayers because at the time we were being slaughtered by our enemies. And it didn't look like God was very strong. So we didn't want to lie. So we took it out. It's nuts. That's what the Nebim did. I mean, only the Jews, right? I mean, we, we, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't look like it's going on. We're getting slaughtered by the enemies. We're saying that God's strong and powerful. It's not, it's not, we can't say. I mean, I'm sure he is, but we can't say it because we don't experience it. So we're not putting that in the prayers. Took it out of the prayers. They ended up putting it back. Who put it back? The Anshir Knesset Agadola put it back in the prayers because they said, no, Zehu Gevurato. Said, don't mistake Gevura for any kind of power. Gevura is a very specific kind of power. The power of Gevura is withholding. As it says, Ezehu Gibor Kovesh Titzro. Right? Who's a Gibor? Who's a, who has Gevura? It's the person who's able to control oneself. That's a pretty powerful thing. And so that's that kind of strength. There's other kinds of strength, right? There's koach and omets and all that kind of thing. But gibura is very specific. Gibura is, is the ability to withhold. And that's what God's doing. He's standing back. And he's unfortunately standing back in very, very difficult situations, but nonetheless necessary situations that we need to experience ourselves and deal with without him jumping in to save the day every single day. I know that we're not talking about this now, but I don't want to leave it dangling, even though I brought it up, so you'll bear with me. There's an analogy that I like to give for this. I don't know if anybody's, uh, it's my favorite analogy. There are a few analogies I give, but this is my favorite one. Have you ever seen the, the movie Ray with Ray Charles, you know, about Ray Charles? Yeah. What's his name? What's the dude's name? Who plays him? Jamie Foxx. Jamie Foxx. Yeah, yeah. Very good performance by Jamie Foxx. So Jamie Foxx, so Ray Charles was not born blind. He went blind in his childhood. He's about 10 years old. Um, and there's this unbelievable scene in the movie, which it's shayach to see the movie just for the scene, but it's, it's worth seeing the movie for its, in its entirety anyway. I mean, tremendous amount of stuff that's learned in this movie. Also about senses, by the way, <clears throat> because it tells you that you, one hallucinates we tend to think of hallucination in visual terms, but Ray Charles had very severe and frightening tactile hallucinations, that he was in rooms in which he felt that the water was filling in the room and rising up to his legs and his waist. And the reason he had those fears is because his brother drowned when he, was a, when he was a child. So he had these very strong tactile hallucinations, which tells you that our brains are not necessarily reliable. Nonetheless, there's a scene in which he's he's going blind, he cannot see. And I mean, he's in rural Georgia and you know, dirt poor. And his mother lives in one room. It's literally a shack that's a room. And he walks into this room calling for his mother. This one room that they live in, right? And his mother's sitting at the end of the room, absolutely silent. And he's walking into the room, and you see there's a boiling pot on the stove, there's a scorpion on the floor. There are sharp objects and he's calling her mommy, mommy, mom, answer me. And she's, she will not answer him. And she's sitting in the corner of the room and you're thinking like, answer her woman, answer him, answer him. Why aren't you answering it? She will not answer him. And she's crying in the corner of the room as he is trying to feel his way through the room to find his mother. And he does finally find her and avoids all of those dangerous things that were going to be very dangerous for him if he ended up getting involved with them. And he hugs her and she's hysterical crying by the time that he gets to her. And he just says to her, I heard you breathing. 
So he gets her. Why didn't she answer him? You realize that she didn't answer him because he needed to learn how to do this on his own because he was going to be a blind man in a world that was not necessarily going to help him. And if she was going to get up and help him through this entire thing all the time, he would not be helped. So there are times where God's strength, imagine the strength that it took her to do that. That's Gvura. So the Anshe Knesset HaGedola said, Zehu Gvurato. That's his strength. So they put it back in the prayers. All the moral of this, don't put into prayers what is not true. So this is a big question right now. A person gets up and starts saying, Ad kan sipori agiu rahamecha, right? Your rahamim get to the nests of birds. Oh, really? I'm not so sure that you can say that because it may be that that's what it seems to us. The sense of it is that to us. Can you say that's the purpose of the mitzvah? That's the... Well, no, you can't. And so, unfortunately, we're going to have to ask you, Mr. Hazan, to step off the teba, because you can't say those things in the prayers. And guess who's posek that halacha? You guessed it, Harambam. So the same Harambam that wrote this reason for the Shilur HaKen in the More Nebuchim, for us and our sensibilities, is the Rambam that says, you hear a guy saying this in the prayers? Get him off the teba. Why? Take a look. And he says this. It's amazing. So he says, Misha Amar Hanunim. If a person in their supplications to God, Mishrihem al Kansipur, Shalolik Ahem al Banim, O Shalosh Hotobe Berobe Mahad. Right? These two misbots that he gives in the Moreh. Yirahem Alenu. If a person says in the prayers, the one who had mercy over the birds in their nest, and about the child and his mother on that same day, they shouldn't be slaughtered. That God who had mercy on them should have mercy on us, which is emphatically defining the nature of those mitzvot, that God's having mercies on these things. Or anything like it. We shut him up. Why do we shut him up? Because these mitzvot, our decrees of the Pasuk in the Torah, of the written decrees of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Torah, Enan Rahamim, they are not mercies. What do you mean they're not mercies? You just said in the morning, they will give the mercies. I didn't say they were mercies. I said those were sensible things to say about the mitzvot for us. I didn't say that's what they are. And he says emphatically here, he goes, Enan Rahamim. Shilu hayum Rahamim, if they were for that, we wouldn't be allowed slaughtering animals at all. It's fascinating. And that's why it's very important to read comprehensively, to understand principles. And so we see this, yeah? Does it stop Harambam from giving the reasonings, from giving sensible presentations, from assigning sense? to things that otherwise do not have sense for us or do not what we would say in our vernacular make sense? No, he makes sense of them. And that's a wonderful thing to do. He says that you should do as much as you can do. Do so. Don't confuse it with the emphatic purpose, but absolutely to do something that gives it sense by all means. So he does this as an example over here with Shofar. Shofar is also a hook. I should be called Shofar. He says, look, Look, I need to, I want to tell you something about Shofar. I, I think that our experience of Shofar, our sense of Shofar teaches us something. And I want to talk to you about that. Shofar is an alarm and it wakes us up. And we'll read that in a second, what he says about it. But before he says any of that, responsibly what he says is, look, even though the blowing of the Shofar Rosh Hashanah is a decree of the written word. And that's enough. I'd like to say that there is a remez yeshbo. It hints to something. To us, to us, the human beings that have taste and smell and all that. It hints something to us. What does it hint to us? It's as if to say, Uru Yishanim Shinadchem. It's as if to say, wake up sleeping people from your slumber. 
and, and arise from your stupor, search your deeds, return, remember your creator. You know, these people, that forget the truth and the futilities of time. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. So inspiring. It's so tasty. But if for whatever reason, I found that this didn't fall in line with something that was going on with the blowing of the shofar in a particular situation or time, it doesn't matter. Gizrat katuv. And that's why it's very important not to get stuck on the sensible things that we assign to the mitzvot as emphatic purposes for the mitzvot. Don't do it. So there's something that Harambam himself writes at the end of dealing with the these inyanim in uh, of hokim. Oops, excuse me. Uh, with the hokim in Hulchot Ma'ila. And we're going to end with this and then I'll answer some questions if, uh, if anybody has. It's a very nice way that Harambam ends it. He says, this is a mesora that we have, a tradition that we have. It says, And how much King David suffered the heretics and for that matter, the idol worshippers. So the heretics among our people, the idol worshippers outside of our people, that would that would taunt and and criticize using the hukim as fodder. And as much as they would chase him with these things, with these 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 lies that they would bring to him because they related to them inappropriately, that they would adam, that they would try to put forth through the simple thinking of human beings, right? He's not saying their particular, he's saying just human thought. What would it cause him to do? He would cling further to the Torah. It says in Psalms, they've thrown at me these, these you know, nonsense, meaningless lies, intentional lies. But I, with all of my heart, will treasure your, your statutes, your decrees, your orders. And it says there as well, in that same chapter, all of your mitzvot are faithful elements of my life. But I have lies that are chasing after me. Save me, help me. Here we go. Then he brings up the korbanot because he knows. By the way, you know, all of the korbanot, they're all hukim. All of them. Now this is important because he goes from Sefer Avodah here to Sefer HaKorbanot. So this is the transition. And he says, this is the end of Sefer Avodah, opening Sefer Korbanot. All of the Korbanot are Hukim. Amru HaChamim, Bishvil Avodah the Korbanot HaOlam Omed. HaChamim said, it's because of the service of the Korbanot that the world stands. Shebaasiyat HaHukim HaMishpatim Zuchim HaYisharim Nachaya Olam Abba. By doing the hukim and the mishpatim, the straight people who are faithful to them merit the world to come. Hikdima Torah tzivuya hukim. Not only that, the Torah preempted the command on the hukim before the mishpatim. As it says, Ushmartim nechukotai v'shpatai yashir yasu atam nadam v'chai b'hem. So that's tonight's principle. And you have the sources for it. And it's important to remember because you will hear this over and over and over again. And it's important to be able to point to it and, and to articulate it and speak it. And that's one element of the framework. Let's see if we've got any questions. Question oh, has his hand up. Are korbanot the only mitzvah where senses are ascribed to God? What do you mean by that, Daniel? I don't know. What, what he had to go for mincha. He means that because right. it says that God likes, enjoys the smell. Is that no, no, smell. no, it says God hears things and he's happy and sees things and he's happy. So, okay, hmm. okay. all right. Ohad has his hand up. Ohad, 
What's your question? Is there is there significance with the usage of bina in the assignment of tam, as it says, "Ra'ila uh, lit bonen and shilomo hevin," versus, for example, yadia? Yeah, because it's a question of trying to understand. You don't there there's there's no initial relationship. So part of understanding is to be able to understand interconnections, right? When we understand something, we understand what it means to understand something is to recognize how it fits. And therefore I understand its meaning, right? Because I get what it is that this thing is in my world. That's what it is to understand. So that's what be nice. I'm trying to see it in those terms. And through that, then I have some ability to relationship with it. Now, another question, but how much power do we give? If we recognize that the ta'amim are their assignments of sensibilities that we give them, how much should they influence our practice? So, for example, by Shiloh HaKen, uh, he was saying that it's it's not appropriate based on this time to go search for the for the for the nest and to try to. No, act. he doesn't say it's not appropriate based on the time. What he says in the treatment of the time is that the well, I mean, you can say that there are two things. He says one, you don't want to cause distress to the mother bird, so steer clear. But he also says that the eggs are not fit to eat in that situation. So hopefully, people will steer it, stay away from it. So he's saying, look, yeah, I mean, in our relationship to it, it should try and steer us, steer us away. But I think in terms of broader terms with regards to your question, if the, if the ta'amim that I assign to a hulk, right, help it come into my life, right? And when I say come into my life, I don't mean in terms of practice, you got to do it. But it helps me to have this sense of it, this connection to it, this meaning of it. It helps in terms of motivation or lack thereof of practice. And that's okay, right? In other words, to do it, you must. But how do you feel about it? What does it mean to you in your life? And those are real questions. And those questions have a relationship to the time that you assign. Does that make sense? No. No? You know what I'm saying? So what's not making sense? We have to make it make sense. So what is not making sense? Without the, ass the assignment of time, you just have a deed. Okay, so you have some, some arbitrary deed there that you have a need to do because God said so. But it's not something that you sense in your life. It's not something that is in, that's part of your world that you feel, see, touch, smell. So of course, the things that you assign it, the time that you assign it, you want to be able to bring that in. You want that to be able to be something that you recognize as part of the corpus of your life and the 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 meaning of Torah in your life. So it's there in order to be able to connect you, see what, what is it you can learn from it, how it is it that you, you, are, you are able to interact with it. You wanna be able to taste it. So of course that changes the way that you interact and, and experience the mitzvah. It doesn't change the imperative of the mitzvah, but it definitely changes the way you experience the mitzvah, how it is that it impacts your life, yeah? yeah. Thank you. There's one question on the right. chat. One question on the chat. Maybe on based on the following pasuk, do we have an obligation? We have an obligation to create reasons for taste for the mitzvot. So, what does this mean? What is the question? Do we have an obligation to create reasons or taste for? I don't understand. Okay, uh, just give a whole show. The pasuk is saying that, you know, if the goyim are to look at the laws to hear of the laws and say ah look at this wise and discerning people what why would they say that would it be because there are reasons given for the mitzvot that they are that they have you know come across and they're saying ah look how wise and discerning they are otherwise they why would they you say doing? Our mitzvot? You know, just hearing hearing of these laws but it doesn't say hearing of them does it it says that they will see it. Well, it says Yishmaun. It does say Yishmaun. So he said, so if they're hearing this and they're seeing you doing it, we're saying that it's, it should be seen as being wise. The Hachamim talk about that pasuk. And they say that the way that the Hachamim look at it is that it includes our knowledge of secular realities. 
And I, when I say secular, I use that, I borrow the term, but the nature of reality. So if I don't, so for example, in the Gemara on Shabbat, they say, what is this Pasuk referring to? It's referring to the ability to calculate the astronomical uh, movements of the moon and stars and so on and so forth. And that if I know how to do that and I don't do it, then I'm failing this Pasuk. Why? Because the Goyim are going to look at me and say, you don't even know what how the world works and you're sitting here doing your things, whatever it is that you're doing. It's absurd. So the Achamim essentially are saying in that, that I have to be able to live these uh, mitzvot in a way that is perceivable by the goyim as wisdom. So it may be that the time for these hukim are valuable in that sense. You know what I'm saying? I think Absolutely. that what you're pointing out is yes, yeah. it very well may be that this is helpful in order to be able to put it forth to the goyim, but not necessarily to make it the reason why I do or do not do it. Understood. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. Any elements that are missing in it? Nope. Nope. Okay. We have time for one last question. Yoshua Metzadon has his hand. I have time. The question is, you have time. We have the last, last question. Yoshua? Yes. yes, please. Hi, uh, Rabbi. Yoshua Ben Zadon. <laughs> Rabbi. <laughs> yes. um, so just, just to clarify, um, for Hukim, we cannot be sure what the purpose is. Now, for Mishpatim, if we're not given the purpose and it's up to us to discover it, how do we know mm. we've discovered? the right uh, purpose. You don't necessarily know that you discover the right purpose, but the thing about the Mishpatim is that it should make sense very clearly that this is something that's appropriate to do. You don't need to assign reasons to Mishpatim. You should be able to see this is part of, it's, it's part of being able to hold a functional society. So there may be nuances that a person is not totally getting. Right? All right, so I have to figure that out. But it's not a matter of it's figuring out the right reason. Those should be sensible to you. Or they should be sensible to the people that are aware of the nature of society and the legal requirements of society and civil running of society and so on. But it's not a matter of, do I get it right in terms of my reasoning? What Harambam says is, if you don't find a reason that's fitting quite well, don't mess around with the mitzvah. But they're, for the most part, things that I recognize as being part of a functional society. Okay. Thank you. It doesn't sound like you're satisfied with that. No, no, I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. I was just... Um... You were just what? No it, is, no, it is what it is. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It's just that... <laughs> We, we never have, we, we, we have to understand that we really would never really have closure and really it's only up to. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell everybody one thing about that. It's a very big problem to attempt to discover the purpose of God's mitzvot. And the reason for that is it's a problem to attempt to look at God having purpose for anything. That in and of itself is a problem. And why is that a problem? Because to say that God has purpose for anything implies that there is motivation for God to do it. And that implies that the motivation is external to God or influencing God. And that cannot. Harambam writes that explicitly in the Mori Nebuchim, but it cannot be. These things emanate from God and they ultimately reach the good because they come from him. But to say that God has purpose that is motivating him to do something is a theological problem. And so that's for another discussion, for another class. And that's one of the reasons why certainly we're not going to get to the end of it because on the one hand, there's a question is, is that can one talk about a purpose in the sense that we mean it with regards to God at all? And two, on its own, that we're meat brains, we're God brains. And so there is a limit to how, how we will be able to know the mind of God. And that's okay. Because we don't need to know the mind of God, nor can we. And it's an important thing to accept in our humility. Yoshua. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Okay. No, he's happy. See, it's better than okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. All right. Everyone. Are we and, good, uh, gentlemen and ladies? Are we good? I have, Anyone I have, else? I, have, I just awesome. have a, one question. Um, what is that? I'm currently reading uh, Sefer Rama Speak of Rabbi Abraham Ben Arambam. Okay. Um, and in the beginning of there, he, he talks a lot about the Tachlit HaMitzvot. Um, he mentioned it a lot to, to reach Pegiyah and to... I can't comment on Rabbeinu Abraham. I'm not a Talmud of Rabbi Abraham. I hear. I'm a Talmud of the Rambam. So I can't speak to his writings. I'm not going to speak to his writings. You, you should probably speak to somebody who has studied his stuff well. Maybe ask Rabbi Faur. Maybe ask Rabbi Faur. Yeah. No. Um, but I was going to ask you, Asaf, the song that you played at the beginning of the of the thing to introduce. You know that song? Um, that's uh, you know that song the, the Hebrew word is La Moleda Shuvironi. No? I don't know what those. No, no, are. sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, One of my favorite songs. Man, I was very happy you did that. Man, man. Yeah, so I have I have Moshe Eliyahu and Faiza Rushdi, which you do you know who they are? Who? Moshe Eliyahu. No. Faiza Rushdi. Faiza Rushdi, no. All right. Well, you need to know who they are. I have a recording of them singing that song in a choir. I'll send it to you. Very, very good. But it made me happy to hear it. So call it a word. You can play it again. All next right. Week also. What is it? We can play it again next week also. No, 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 no. Switch it up. Switch it up. All right. Very good. Thank you, Rabbi, everyone. Rabbi, Rabbi, fab, fabulous. Thank you so much. That was Thank really special. Okay. Next week, we have Rav Faur, um, part two. Listen to part one. It's up on YouTube if you haven't seen it yet. It's um, fundamentally listen to them both. And we, see, we hope to see you, every, everyone, next week. Thank you. Laila Tov. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.